whole notion of thinking is flawed. 400 notes deep. <coughs> uh, it's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, if you're a visitor or if you're new to joining us here, thank you for coming. We'd love to have you with us. We're going to have a cup of tea and coffee later on, and please stay and get to know us there. Uh, partway through, the children will be going out. They're in different age groups and classes, so you'll see one of the teachers, and he will be pointed to different rooms for different ages and stages. You'd be welcome to join us in that. A couple of notices. It's Holy Week, so next Friday, Good Friday, we're meeting at Priory Street at 9.30. So please join us there at, for the service early in the morning. And then there's the Walk of Witness in the town. Uh, look it up on Facebook and all the notices will be in the church notes and newsletter. And on Sunday, it'll be 10 o'clock at Neston and 10.30 at Priory Street for our early Easter morning service. And I think there's just only one other notice. Um, it's only about a month until the next church meeting. I can feel the tension and excitement uh, starting to rise already. Folks, at that church meeting, we need to find a new treasurer and a new church secretary. And I know you're putting your hands up. I can see all the hands going up already for those volunteers. Thank you so much. Please come and talk to me perhaps afterwards or talk to one of the other leaders um, about that role. It's not a particularly onerous role, um, but we really need someone to fulfill those roles. They're legal requirements. So we need a treasurer and a secretary. And we need to think about that quite soon because that church meeting is coming up really soon. People are moving and changing lives and things like that. So we do need to think about those roles. If you think that you might be interested, they're not particularly onerous. Come and have a chat to myself, one of the other leaders. We'd love to have a talk to you about that. Uh, as soon as possible. Adrian, Joe. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. 
then all nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen. Let us sing our praises to our King this morning.
pray for our children as we go to their homes. Father God, we lift up our young people to you this morning. We thank you for them. We thank you for our leaders who are going to be teaching them. We just pray a blessing upon them all this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there are flags which have got age groups on them. So if you can spot the right flag and youth just follow Dan, I've been told. <laughs> and have a good time. Good morning, guys. Um, we're going to be here for a little while, I think, because there's so many kids, which is a good thing. So. But we're going to do a bit of an uh, intercessory prayer. So if you're um, new to church, if you're just coming here as a visitor, welcome. Um, this is a time for reflection as a church. Uh, I'm going to lay out a few things uh, before the Lord. Our God is a personal God. He wants to hear uh, what we've got to say. And um, so we just uh, welcome you to... Close your eyes, um, open up your heart to, to Christ. And guys, if there's anything, obviously, I'm, you know, you've got on your own hearts, this is a good time as a congregation to lay it before God in prayer, who always hears. So if you close your eyes. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy, holy, holy is your name. Father, we're here today to praise you and to learn and hear about who you are and your son, Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life. Father, we know as we come before you, it's not like you don't know what's going on in our own lives or in this world. You're always around us. You know everything, Father God. And we know and we come in confidence that actually prayer is for us. This prayer, Father God, is for us. It's for us to open up our hearts and our minds to the Spirit. And so, Father God, that's the first thing we pray for. We pray for the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, to come upon ourselves as a congregation, as individuals. Lord, it's a big world and there's a lot going on. But like we said, Father, you are in control. And when we, whatever we pray for today, Lord, we are ultimately praying for your kingdom to come. And we are rejoicing that your kingdom is coming and your will is being done. Lord, with all the world uh, the way it is, Father God, with so many conflicts kicking off, Lord Jesus, around, around us, uh, it can be difficult um, to, uh, to not feel the stress of being continually told things in the news. But Father, we just declare you are the Lord of our lives and we will put our focus on you. We will pray for those countries, Lord for the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to reach them, no matter what is going on in those environments. We just lift up the ongoing uh, Ukraine and Russia conflict. And Lord, only you can bring peace. We do pray for the leaders of all the nations, of course, Lord God. We pray that you move into their hearts and their lives and into the circumstances, Lord Jesus, that they find themselves in, that they will speak the truth that you want spoken, and you will bring the healing that only you can bring, Father God, in those environments. We pray for Israel. We pray for the ongoing Hamas and the issues in Gaza. Father, we do not want to take uh, sides, Lord Jesus, per se, with the majority. Father, it's a complicated scenario. And so all we can pray for is for your spirit to go down there. To look out for those who have declared your name and are following and seeking you in those environments. 
that, Father, where there is trauma and, and so much hardship, on, both, on all sides, all sides, Lord, Lord, let your spirit set alight, Father God. Go across that nation and nations of people, Father. And, Father, rather than destruction, at the end of it, Father God, let there be so many declaring the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. And putting their hope in you, not in man's efforts. Father, thank you so much for this amazing church. Look at the size of it, Father God. You have blessed it, you know, with Leicester and Caution, Father God. And ongoing, Father, we pray that you continue to work in our own hearts and our own lives and what we can do in this church. We want to be witnesses, Father. We want to witness what you're doing. We want to be partakers of that, Father God. We want our own personal testimonies, Father, of how we've seen what you have done in our community. And so we just pray for your protection over our church, over our eldership, over our leadership, over our pastors. And we pray with renewed vigor, Father, that you would pour out your spirit again and again and again upon the whole of Caution and our churches. Father, thank you so much that we have so many kids and, Father, we're in a building, Father, for the next generation of caution. And, Father, we just pray again, Lord, pour out your spirit as the leaders of, uh, go out there, Father, and teach our kids. Let the word of truth reign into that and let, uh, lead into their heart, Father of God, and produce a crop of the gospel in them. So, Father, when we're uh, much more older and wrinkly, Father God, these young ones, Father God, are the ones standing up and bringing that new energy, Lord Jesus, in a different way, in a different dynamic, Father, because you're doing a new thing. And we just, pour, we just pray for your protection over them with all of the ideologies and all of the other aspects and pressures of this world, uh, and that seems to continually be coming in. We, pr we pray, Father God, that they will understand that you are the way, you are the truth. And you are the one that will give them life. And as a congregation, that's what we pray for today. Now, Lord, open our hearts now to the gospel, Father. Almost 2,000 years ago, you did the greatest thing, which has brought us all here in this room. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, your only begotten son, an innocent, sinless person. He died on the cross for my sin, for our sins. Lord, we want to leave this place different people. Speak, Father God, through your word to our hearts today, Lord Jesus, as we hear the word from Adam. Yours is the kingdom, the power and all the glory. We're your people. Amen. Am I on? Oh. The Jesus promised to Jerusalem as king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. 
They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Great, thank you very much, Pam. Well, do keep your Bibles open or your phone app or whatever you've got uh, to look at God's word this morning. Uh, why don't we pray together as we begin? Uh, thanks to Paul for praying for us as a church family this morning. Let's pray as we look at God's word now. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here this morning. Uh, we've come from different places, uh, different contexts, different backgrounds, Father, but we've all come here to listen to your word. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for what you're going to speak to each one of us now in our own hearts, and thank you for what you're going to say to us as a church. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me start by asking you a direct question this morning. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Today is Palm Sunday. Everyone now knows that. It's the start of Holy Week. And I don't know uh, if you've had time to think about Holy Week in your busy schedule. Some of you will be, uh, have been finishing Lent and be waiting for this uh, the start of Holy Week. Some of you uh, will be thinking, hang on a minute, Holy Week, what, that's now? That's today? Ooh. Well, can I suggest to you this morning that it's a good chance for you to stop and pause this morning and think about Holy Week coming up, the last events in Jesus' earthly life before he went to the cross. And I want you to think this morning, who is Jesus to you? What does he mean to you? If I grabbed one of these microphones and I came round the different rows, and I got all the answers, I'm sure there would be different answers. And you know what? That's okay. I'm not looking for one answer, because there will be many. So I want you to keep that thought in your mind this morning, as we look at God's word in chapter 21. But before we dive straight into this passage, we actually need to look at the verses just before chapter 21, to get an idea of the meaning of what Jesus is happening with Jesus here why he's coming to Jerusalem. So, in your Bibles, and I think, hopefully, it will be behind me. There you go. That is a big screen. Right. If you uh, just have a look at chapter 20, uh, verses 29 to 31, it says this. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them, be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. That is an incredible moment, by the way. And if you've never read that before, let me just explain to you what that means in that moment there. See, these people, these two blind men, have recognized who Jesus is. They call him the son of David. And what that means is, which is hugely significant, that they are calling him the messianic king. 
They are calling him the savior of the world. They recognize he is the promised king who's been promised for thousands of years. And so they're calling out his official name. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. These two blind men are the first people to publicly declare that Jesus is the son of God. And the next amazing thing is Jesus allows them to do that. He allows them to do that. If you know your Bible, that you would know that up until this point, Jesus always says to people publicly, don't tell anyone who I am. He performs a miracle and he says, don't tell anyone who I am. And yet here, we have these blind men coming to Jesus, calling him son of David, and Jesus says, yes, what would you like me to do for you? And you feel the tension in that moment. As his disciples, who have always been told to keep it down, have suddenly seen Jesus declare who he is. Well, they'll be thinking, is this all right? Is this all right? Jesus, do you really want to say that now? So there's tension there, and there's excitement and joy. And you see, what Jesus has done in that moment is he has fired the starting pistol. He's thrown down the gauntlet. He's kicked off the match to say... I am the Messiah that everyone has been waiting for. I am the king, and I'm coming into my city. So that is an amazing bit there, just before chapter 21. And we don't go into chapter 21. Sorry, that was chapter 20. We don't go into chapter 21 without knowing that bit there. You see, by Jesus going into Jerusalem now, he is heading straight into confrontation with the authorities. Jesus and the authorities always clashed. Jesus created ripples wherever he went, taking on those people who thought that they had control over weaker people. Jesus took them on, and he uh, confronted the authority there. This time it's going to be different, because the ending of this confrontation is going to be something that we've never seen before. These people had never seen before. It's going to start a chain of events that changes the whole of history. And so, there you go. It's like Jesus has started this event that's going to ripple throughout history. By saying who he is publicly, by declaring he is the Messiah. Now let's go back to chapter 21 and walk through this chapter together and pick out what Jesus is doing here. Jesus and his disciples were drawing near to the city of Jerusalem on foot. And at this point, Jesus sends out two of his disciples to go on ahead of him and to find a donkey's colt. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's a young male donkey. And Jesus has chosen this young donkey to go and ride on. Jesus knew exactly where to find this donkey's colt. Now, you might think to yourself, well, Jesus has been around that area a little bit before and he's checked out where all the animals are and he's been down there and he's made a deal and he's uh, paid a bit of money, put down a deposit for a donkey. But actually, that's not the case. It doesn't say that in the passage, does it? It doesn't say that because Jesus knew, being Lord of everything, the promised king, exactly where to find that donkey. And exactly the time that those, the owner of the donkey would just hand it over to Jesus. And do you know how he knew that? Because Jesus is God. And Jesus knows everything. This is the Jesus, you remember, who can calm the wind and the waves. So, of course, he knows where all the animals are. And, of course, he goes to get that donkey. You see, Jesus has planned every moment of Holy Week himself. He knows exactly what is going to happen to him. He knows exactly the conversations he is going to have, and he knows the action plan that is going to lead to his crucifixion and agony and agonizing death on the cross, and he knows already he's going to rise from the dead. This is not an accident, all these events. This doesn't catch Jesus by surprise. It might catch the disciples by surprise, as we see as we keep reading. Now, what's interesting in this passage is that normally when uh, the disciples write in the Bible about events, they don't go over the details, do they? They don't pause to go through, uh, you know, what the colors were in the street or which way the wind was blowing or what the weather was like that day. 
And yet, in Matthew chapter 21, we see six verses dedicated to the plans that Jesus had in place. Again, that is deliberate to show that Jesus is in control of everything. Now, if you look down at verse 5, here is a messianic prophecy about the king who would come to save his people. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. This prophecy is from the book of Zechariah, written 500 years before Jesus rode into Jerusalem on this colt. And as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, you can see there, well, thousands of people would have lined the route on the city into Jerusalem. It was Passover, so thousands of pilgrims, Jewish pilgrims, would have flocked to the city. That wasn't a coincidence either, because when a king comes into a city, he needs the crowd to be there, praising and worshipping him. And we see there in the passage that people um, cut down branches from the trees and they laid them in the road. Um, we haven't got any palms here this morning, have we? Didn't see any on the way into uh, Corsham this morning. No uh, tropical palm trees. It's a shame. But the palms are significant. The palms are significant. You might think that they're just waving them in the air, but actually it comes back to Psalm 96. Psalm 96 says these words. If you've got a Bible, turn to Psalm 96, verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the seas resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Key verse, let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. That's amazing. The people are waving the palm trees, palm leaves, because they're excited, not the whole tree, the leaves. They're excited and they're singing for joy and they think, well, Oh, you know, how can we sing for joy? What's the nearest thing we've got to flags? Oh, we'll take those branches, we'll wave them in the air, we'll put them on the ground. And yet, it's been predicted in Psalm 96 that that's exactly what would happen. And then Isaiah 55, verse 12. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Amazing. The whole of creation will sing when the king comes. The whole of creation. It's incredible, isn't it? In Luke's gospel, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, his disciples burst into songs of joy. And the Pharisees tell Jesus, control your disciples, keep them quiet. What are they doing? Jesus responds, I tell you, he replied, if those disciples keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. Even the stones will cry out. So still sitting in the back of the hall, I wonder if you can see what it says on the stones. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> Jesus knows the whole of creation sings as it recognizes and rejoices that the king has come. The whole city is in uproar as the king is coming. They're shouting Hosanna to the king, which literally translates to save us, rescue us. They know he's the saviour king who is coming. The king has come to Jerusalem to save his people. Now, what was Jerusalem like in those days? You may know it was a city under siege. It was a city under the oppression from the Roman occupiers. A people who were under the boot of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire watched them at all times. Even in their own temple, they were watched by the Roman Empire because next to the temple, there was a fortress that was built called Antonia. And the Antonia fortress had up to 500 Roman soldiers in it, always looking down into the temple courts. There's the temple court down there, making sure nothing was kicking off in the temple. So imagine living in occupation. We can't really imagine that in the UK, can we? Living with an occupying force watching every move we make, making sure that we don't have our own government, making sure they are in charge. I read a book the other day that said in the Antonia Fortress, they used to keep the high priest's robes for the temple. And that was because they were in charge 
of what celebrations were allowed to take place in the temple and which weren't. And if there are any celebrations that were going to cause trouble for the Roman Empire, well, sorry, the temple's closed today. You can't take part in that ceremony. So imagine a Jewish person in a city at that point. Jesus is coming along the road straight towards them. See, this sort of uh, um, entrance to the city only happens when a Roman emperor is coming into the city. He would have his chariots behind him, his army, drum beats and music and fanfare. So imagine what the Romans were thinking at that moment, seeing this fanfare coming towards them. Well, the Romans would be on high alert, wouldn't they? The people of the city were full of joy, thinking that Jesus has come to set them free from the Roman Empire. To set them free from years of oppression and injustice. And so they're excited. They're expectant. But what we learn in this passage is that Jesus has not come to confront the Roman Empire. Let me say that again. Jesus has not come to confront the Roman Empire. He hadn't come to lead an army against them. He hadn't come to start a Jewish rebellion. Remember Zechariah's prophecy in verse 5. It says, Say to the daughter of Zion, that's Israel, Behold, your king is coming to you. And how is he coming to you? Humble and mounted on a donkey. Humble and mounted on a donkey. That was completely the opposite of what everyone expected, by the way. Jesus was the triumphant king who'd come to Jerusalem, but not with an invading army. Jesus had come as a humble servant king on a donkey. What king rides a donkey? Now, surely we can forgive his disciples at this point for wondering, is Jesus lacking in PR training here? A conquering king like Jesus would surely ride a white stallion or a Belgian draft. That's a type of horse, by the way, not a beer. (laughs) Surely that's what they would think. He's coming on a white stallion to set us free. That's the way the world thinks. That's the way the world sees power. Coming on a big horse, big feet, coming in power with an army. But Jesus didn't want a war horse, otherwise he would have brought one. Jesus didn't want an army, or he would have brought one. He didn't need need music because he had the praise of his people lining the route. Instead of these things, we see that Jesus had a plan, completely shocking everyone and doing the opposite of what the world expects. You see, Jesus is a humble, gentle servant king. He's confident, but he comes in humility. He's confident, but he's loving. He's confident, but he's gentle. And in fact, Jesus is the most compassionate king who ever existed or will ever exist. Jesus, by his right titles, is king of the world. But he demonstrates on his ride into Jerusalem what it means to be a humble servant leader. I wonder if you think about your life experience, how many humble servant leaders do you know? Are you a humble servant leader? What's it like where you work? In your school? When you walk around the community? Do you see humble servant leadership from people? Or do you see people who want things done by force? Or their own power? Or things that make other people feel strong because they've got control over you. That's what you're more likely to see, I think, in our world, rather than humble servant leadership like Jesus. And as we think about humble servant leadership for a moment, I want you to think again back to my question at the beginning, who is Jesus to you? Do you recognize Jesus as your triumphant and humble servant king today? Or is Jesus just your counselor? Is Jesus just your friend? Is Jesus just your consultant in this life? Is Jesus just someone you run to 
when you get into trouble or you feel bad for your sin. Jesus wants so much more from you than just to play a small part in your life. Jesus wants all of you. He wants all of us. And he wants to be our king for all eternity. He doesn't want you to sit on the fence undecided about who he is. He invites you to know him as your Lord and your saviour, as your king, your forever king who loves you and knows you completely. That's the sort of king I want. I wonder what sort of king you would like today. Now, by his entrance into Jerusalem, Jesus intends to make a statement. According to Pastor Tim Keller, Jesus' statement to the world is, crown me or kill me. Crown me or kill me. Despise me as a lunatic or give your love, give all your all to love and to serve me. Despise me as a lunatic or give your all to love and to serve me. You see, Jesus doesn't have a fence that you can sit on. He wants you to be hot or cold, nothing in between. That is, remember I said at the beginning that he's making his public announcement that has led to a life or death moment. This is the life or death moment. When it comes to Jesus, there is no lukewarm. There is no sitting on the fence. You're either with him, for him, or you're against him. That is so challenging, isn't it? Now, some of you may be sitting here this morning thinking, whoa, you're laying on that a bit thick there, Adam. But this is what the Bible teaches. This is why Jesus came. He came into Jerusalem, and people shouted Hosanna, which means save me, save us. So Jesus came with a purpose, didn't he? He didn't just come to celebrate and have a celebration that day. There is more to Jesus, and he's showing us in this passage. Crown me or kill me, there is nothing in between. He says to us today, crown me, recognize me as your king and savior, or kill me from your life. Nothing in between, don't be lukewarm, be hot or be cold. Now what happens if we do, if we dare to recognize Jesus as our king? What happens if we dare to let him into our lives? if we dare to let him take control over our lives. You see, if we recognize Jesus as king and our Lord and savior, he brings us justification over our sins. He gives us a free gift of salvation. His blood was shed to cover all our sins, all the wrong choices we've made in our lives. Jesus gives us the power of his name. Jesus gives us reconciliation and peace with our God forever. To receive this salvation, to receive Jesus' forgiveness and power, we need to start by surrendering to him. We need to start by surrendering to the conquering king that he is. We have to believe in his name and turn back from our sins, even the ones you committed yesterday even the ones you committed this morning. Back to our passage, text. Jesus didn't come to conquer Jerusalem from its enemies, the Roman Empire. Because if he did, what do you think would happen? What do you think would happen if he had actually overthrown the Roman Empire? Do you think that would be the end of the bloodshed? Well, <clears throat> Paul alluded in his prayers this morning that of course not. Of course not. The conflict would not end. Look at our world today. One conflict finishes, another begins. You take out the Roman Empire, another empire will replace it. Russia invaded Ukraine, and that has led to a bloody and costly war. ISIS-K attacked Russia on Friday night, and that is going to lead to more bloodshed. An occupying force is beaten, another one comes and replaces it. An argument gets out of hand, reconciliation happens, and soon enough, something else will come along in a different form. This is what happens according to the world. That is what happens according to the world's standards. But Jesus has the power to change everything in our lives. He has the power to conquer our sins forever and set us free 
to serve him with joy and peace in our hearts forever. I wonder if you've thought about the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You see, the power of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, has the power to change our motivations in life. It has the power to change our desires. The Holy Spirit has the power to change our situations. Those situations where we think to ourselves, how am I going to get out of this? I can't see how this is going to go. And yet the Spirit works and changes things beyond our comprehension. The Spirit works to take away our fears, to change our temptations. The Spirit works to resolve conflicts, anxieties, take away addictions. You see, God has a plan for each one of us, doesn't he? Just like he planned the events of Holy Week perfectly, he's planned this day perfectly. And the reason you're here is because God planned for you to be here. Does that blow your mind? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Jesus entered Jerusalem on a young donkey's colt. He comes on one of the slowest animals on earth. Sorry if you love donkeys. He comes not for a PR stunt, but he comes as a humble servant, vulnerable and defenseless. I mean, if you're going to go into battle, it would be safer probably to walk than ride on a donkey, wouldn't it? But you know what? This is the gospel. This is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. While we were still sinners, weak and defenseless, Jesus Christ died for us. Jesus covers our sins by his blood, shed on the cross for us, in our weakness, in our brokenness, in our desperation. I wonder if you've had a desperate moment in your life this week, where you've just needed God. You see, Jesus knows that the Jewish people were not slaves to Rome, but more than that, they were slaves to their own sin. And that is why he's come to Jerusalem. That is why this Holy Week leads him to his own crucifixion. Let me say that again. Jesus knows that his people, that means you and I, are slaves to sin. And that is why he willingly went to the cross to suffer in agony, let's not miss that bit out, so that we would receive forgiveness, mercy, and grace forever. So then we've got this scene, haven't we? In the verse 12, what does Jesus do as soon as he gets to Jerusalem? He goes straight into the temple. He goes straight into the temple. He doesn't go to the garrison and kick the Romans out. He goes straight into his father's house. And there, Jesus kicks out the corrupt officials from within his own people. The money changers, the sacrificial sellers who were robbing his people. Jesus rearranges the furniture around like you or I would in our own house. Because the temple is his house. Only God can claim that right. See, the corrupt officials were sinning against the people, and more importantly, they were sinning against God. They were putting themselves in God's place, and that's what we do every time we sin. We put ourselves in God's place. We start worrying about things that are above us, things that are beyond our control. We put ourselves in places that belong to God, his place of sovereignty and ownership. We take on responsibility for things that are not ours to manage. And we seek pleasure in place of God. That is our sin. And so Jesus goes right into God's heart in the temple. The money changers were right at the heart of God's city and God's people. They were sinning against the people, but sinning against God. And so Jesus removes them. That is the only thing you can do with sin. You have to remove it. You can't let it linger. In verse 14, we read, as Jesus walked through the temple courts, the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them because that is what the temple is for. The heart of God is for those people who need healing and they recognize it. So those people came to Jesus and he healed them. And then we have children follow Jesus in there, singing his praises as the king. 
Hosanna to the son of David. We need to be like little children coming to God. Save us, Jesus. Save us, son of David. Immediately, there is tension again, isn't there? The chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things Jesus did, and their response? They were furious. Their hearts were hard. Can you see that? They couldn't stand the thought of new people coming into the temple to praise God in their own way. But this is exactly who Jesus came for. Jesus came to win the praise of all people. The blind, the lame, the children, the lonely, the sick, the poor, the outcasts. These are the people Jesus came for. I wonder how we would react if new people came into Caution Baptist Church and decided that they wanted to worship Jesus in a different way. That's a real challenge to our hearts, isn't it? Jesus welcomes everyone into his family and he accepts everyone's praise. So who is Jesus to you this morning? Who is Jesus to you this morning? Who is Jesus to me Who is Jesus to Caution Baptist Church? Who is Jesus to you? If you truly recognize him as the triumphant king that he is, let me tell you that Jesus is your king and you will surrender authority of your life over to Jesus. That means you will trust him with every detail of your life and allow the good plans he has in place for you to work their way through. Now, I know some people sitting here this morning did put their faith in Jesus once. And for whatever reason, your heart has gone cold and that you've forgotten that Jesus is your king every day. You've stopped giving Jesus the honor he deserves. You've become hard-hearted towards the king. And you've been trying to run your own life. I know that some people here have been trying to be tough and cope with their own sins. Trying to get God's acceptance. If only this time I controlled this sin and I didn't do it again. I can do it. I can do it on my own. Well, let me tell you this morning, you cannot defeat your sins unless they've already been forgiven by God. If you trust Jesus with all your sins, and I do mean all of them, they will be covered by Jesus. When we make war on those sins, we can do that because they've already been defeated. They've already been covered by Jesus' blood. They've already been punished for. Those are the only sins that we can get victory over, the ones that have already been forgiven by God. But a person who takes their sin lightly, who sees no problem with living in sin because they're saved by grace, well, let me just tell you this morning that those people are living in an extremely dangerous place. Those people need to turn back to the king today. Surrender to him afresh today and ask for his forgiveness and help and he will give it. Palm Sunday is a good time to do that. It's a refresh coming into Holy Week. And if we truly surrender to Jesus, then we will see that he is humble. He is gentle. He is the servant king. The one who knows us the one who understands you, the one who delights to save you from your weakness and your sin. We're all sinners in need of a saviour, and on Palm Sunday, the king has arrived. We're going to pray together now. Let's pray. This morning, I'm going to lead us into a prayer that asks the Lord Jesus into our lives. Now, this may be something you've already done. But for some of you, it gives you an opportunity to do this for the first time. For some of you, it gives you the opportunity 
to refresh your hearts with the promises you made to Jesus. If it's the first time you've prayed this prayer, can I just encourage you, I would love to meet you and speak to you. And I'm going to be sitting right at the back of this hall. It's a long hall. I'm going to be sitting right at the back. And I'd love you to come and speak to me after the service if you prayed this prayer for the first time. Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner. I need you and I want your forgiveness. I accept your death as the penalty for my sin and recognize that your mercy and grace is a gift you offer to me because of your great love, not based on anything I have done. Please cleanse me and make me your child. By faith, I receive you into my heart as the Son of God and as Saviour and Lord of my life. From now on, help me live for you with you in control. In your precious name, amen. I'm looking for somebody. Adrian, thank you.
morning to praise your name and glorify you and bless you. We just take this time to thank you very much. Amen. We're not going to forget that the kids are going to come back through and we're going to sing a song with them. I don't know if Debbie will mind.
<laughs> let's uh, let's uh, finish this fantastic service in prayer. Let's pray. Um, dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that as we've heard today, your glorious procession 2,000 years ago into Jerusalem and how the people cried, Hosanna, here comes the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I pray, O oh Lord, that that will be our cry. And as Adam was preaching this morning, that we will either crown him or kill him. And I pray for each of us individually today and for myself that we will crown our dear Lord Jesus and that he will be front and center of each of our lives, O oh Lord. And that each of us this morning, whether for the first time or for a long time, that we will press into the Lord. He will indeed be our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So therefore, I would pray for each of you that the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and grant you peace. And dear friends, brothers and sisters, go in strength to love and serve the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There will be prayer now. There will, and so if you want to pray and if you've been touched by what's been preached this morning. There's prayer over here uh, where people would love to pray for you. And Adam is at the back and would love to hear from you as well if you want to respond to that call to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you want to crown him in your life for the first time or renew again, please don't miss this opportunity. And also stay for fellowship, enjoy being with each other, to drink coffee and even tea apparently at the end this time as well. So yeah, God bless you all. See you again. Bye-bye.